Seth, we got a great case today. Are you ready for this? I am ready, sir. All right. So the technology we're going to talk about, it's going to involve mobile phones. It's going to involve cryptocurrency and it's going to involve online accounts. Right. And the crime here involved three different elements. You had SIM swapping, which we'll get into, uh, somebody gaining control of a victim's online accounts and a theft of funds, which is fraud. But here it's not traditional funds. This is crypto, right? So a little bit different. Yep. And the criminals, it's a gang of young men, uh, ages about 17 to 26, and they call themselves the community. Yeah, not the sexiest of names. Uh, and the clincher, and we're going to try to do this for all of our, of our episodes here, uh, that this was impossible to defend against, that even deploying the best, best practices, um, the best technology, and being the most conservative you can be, sometimes there are elements outside of one's control. Uh, but what you can do, obviously, is try to lower your risk. In this case, this was one that was impossible to defend against. Sit back and enjoy this episode of eCrime Bites. I looked at the court documentation. I looked at Facebook profiles and so forth, and I am still kind of surprised why he just stuck with Ricky because when I hear the name Ricky, I, it's like I thought he was like 12. You know, I thought this was like a kid doing something on at his computer. At some point when you're a Ricky, do you have to decide, I think, at a formal age of maybe 13, 14, are you sticking with Ricky, Ricky Schroeder, who changed it to Rick Schroeder, the actor, or are you all in on Ricky? Or do you go with Richard or Rick? Or Dick, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, first of all, I think there's a lot more here, just in terms of the amusement of this guy's name. It almost sounds like a made-up name. I've heard of a Schumacher, uh, but a hand Schumacher, I, I've never heard that before. And far be it from me to make fun of somebody's last name. But I do wonder if his, you know, was did he have a hard time growing up as a kid? Was he kind of known as you know Dick Handjob, things like that? That's what I would have come up with. Um, so uh, there's, there's a whole set of stories to tell about this guy's name for sure. Well, let's add another layer to this. Ricky is from Pasco County, Florida. So in some of these articles, I can tell you he was referred to as Florida man. Yeah, we should keep a running tab on how many of our cases involve uh, directly or indirectly the, the dreaded Florida man nomenclature. I love it. Well, one of the things that was interesting on Ricky um, – is that he loved to show off his toys on Facebook. So I found his Facebook profile. Um, I didn't do anything tricky. It was just public, open to everybody. Um, I'm not going to tell you what the link is, but it's not hard to find with his name. And when you go on there, um, there's a lot of toys up on his Facebook, You know, pictures of toys that are his toys. And we say toys. We don't mean toys. We mean like adult toys, right? So we're talking, well, you that, know. Uh, well, hold up there. <laughs> we're, we're talking like the nice adult toys, like trucks and quads and things. Be careful there. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't going in. Yeah, your minds are more in the gutter than mine. I meant like cars and trucks and watches and stuff that, you know, someone over the age of nine would think is kind of cool. Yep. Yep. All right. <clears throat> so, yeah, he has a lot of pictures of these toys up there, trucks and so forth. And I'll go through what he has and I'll try to describe it since you can't see it. Um, and there's interesting is there's an April 1st posting on there of a letter about his case that said the feds are backing off that I could only take as a joke because it happened on April 1st that we'll talk about a little bit too. But out of looking at his Facebook wall, the number one thing that popped in my mind was going back to Robert De Niro in the movie Goodfellas. Where basically like when you pull a job off, you don't buy flashy stuff. You don't show people that you have money. It was like Ricky did the exact opposite. You know, everything on Facebook was about all the cool stuff that he just bought. So let's talk about a little bit about that. Here on April 11th, and <clears throat> Seth and I can see these pictures just so you're, you can kind of visualize what's going on here. On April 11th, 2017, Ricky has a picture of a nice black truck hooked up to a very nice Sea-Doo. Well, let's be a little more detailed here. What you have here is a 
stanced, looks like either a Ram or a, yeah, it's a Ram. And it's, you know, a lot of trucks get kind of a lift kit. This is the opposite of that. This is a truck that's been lowered with humongously wide um, wheel spacers so that the tires are a good seven or eight inches outside of the body. Uh, and it's towing, a, it's a very clearly custom painted blue with a, a trailer and uh, a red sea um uh jet ski um very much embodying the florida man who had new money uh motif i would say <laughs> that's awesome yeah i forgot you were the car guy you can just you totally just, car guy yes. go for it man just describe all these then yeah because the I'm next one the next one on may 2nd 2017 we got another sea but it's it's very different than the other one because this one's green yeah, it's green. This is more like uh, the sports car of the of the Sea Dew jet ski world. The other one was more of the sedan. Uh, <laughs> this looks more like a single rider. But everyone knows you can't just have one jet ski because then you can't have fun with your friends. Exactly. Yeah. Then we so take this a picture turn. we have uh, the dreaded quad. Um, this is May thirtieth, two thousand seventeen. Yeah. So all that he had a great spring of twenty seventeen for sure. So this is, uh, I'm not even sure how you would describe it. It's, it's clearly a quad that is designed just to go off road and tear up the dirt rather than actually act as functional, like to tow a plow or, you know, something along those lines. It's closer to a dune buggy than it is a quad because it, yeah. when I think of a quad, I think four tires and a, a single person on there, you know, a legal right. single person. Not somebody this is a four seater quad. This is, this is like a dune buggy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's probably fun. But I'm not, I don't think I'm the right demographic to drive it. <laughs> yeah. So then, same year, September 26, 2017, we have the oh, truck that we talked about earlier. Yeah. But it's now hooked to an actual, what I would call a quad, like a single person quad. It's a white uh, on the it trailer. It is a different it. quad. So yeah, for those keeping quad. score, sorry, sorry, I, I talked over you. I'm sorry. For those no, keeping no. score, you have two quads because. You know, one quad is not as good as two. And a pair of jet skis, probably an expensive array of different trailers to tow these things, and a, uh, a fairly expensive um, pickup truck that's been customized with probably rims that are like $3,000 each. Not that they're pretty rims. It's not my taste. Yeah, and, and the green quad, the one that looks like the Doom buggy, is clearly on the back. You can see the green seats yep. here. So, so he's, got, he's, double, he's double quad in the back there. Let's go to the next picture. We got November 12, 2007. We've got a new quad because this one's dark blue. Yeah, that's a third quad. And this is now in November. So we've gotten, I guess, six months or so of a buying spree of, let's call it a very certain demographic toys. <laughs> All right. On January 27th of 2018, it looks like he may have another dune buggy style it's quad. It's a like the fourth four quad. And you can tell because it's got significantly knobbier tires. In fact, those look like Mad Max type tires. I would, I would see in a Mad Max movie and red shock absorbers, which I guess is very <laughs> different from the other ones. All these vehicles are pretty awesome, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, they're kind of cool. <laughs> February twentieth, two thousand eighteen. You see the truck that we talked about earlier and that quad that we just talked about together, just kind of shown off in his yard on a picture. Um, on June 1st, 2018. That is a different picture. truck, my friend. Is it? Oh, it is. That is an it absolutely is. different truck. That is a more updated Ford F-150 with a lift kit and extended tires. Uh, it almost looks like a Tonka truck version of a lift kit, lifted uh, F-150, but that is a real vehicle because it's under a, tra a, um, a bridge. Yep, like a train. And by the way, it's a fairly tight fit. Like, <laughs> I'm not sure how close the, the tolerances are on there. I would say if that fit under the bridge, maybe he had half an inch of play there. So then we have July 8, 2018, and I would say this is probably a new quad again, right? It's definitely a new quad. This one has, interestingly, it's got like a red motif, a lot of red accents. I wonder if he traded in the old truck for the new or he's doubled up the trucks. Yeah, it's hard to tell. Yeah. But it's it's definitely new vehicles. We have not seen either one of these. Well, we saw definitely the truck. a new yeah, a new looks like another four person quad with uh red rims. Very tasteful. 
All right. And then on April 1st, 2019, there's this letter. And this is just really weird. It's like blacked out. So you think it's real. But then it says something along the lines of it comes from an attorney's office. It says, like, I have been advised that the state will prosecute this case and not federal government. I will keep you updated. And it looks like he's all excited about not being prosecuted as heavily. And I don't know if it's real that he's not being prosecuted as heavily or if it's just a, an April fool's joke. Cause it is April 1st, 2019 that he posted this thing. So I thought it was kind of interesting. He mentioned his case at all on his public website, but he did. All right. So at this point, since authorities know of Ricky Schumacher, I'm sorry, hand Schumacher and <laughs> And his uh, connection with the uh, source number one that we talked about using things like Discord and um, Telegram. Authorities are now able to monitor the chat servers and watch what people in the community say. So this is when they start linking people to account names. So at some point um, on these chat servers, someone asked a question, literally, like, quote, unquote, Ricky. They said, you know, hey, Ricky, and asked a question. And then an, an account by the name of Coin Mission responded to it. So you can start to say, ah, oh, well, Ricky Handschumacher is probably this Coin Mission uh, account on this chat service. And the thing that was interesting is when they saw that chat happen, they went back and looked at what they, the law enforcement went back and looked at what they had with the confidential source. And the confidential source said, oh, yeah, Ricky is Coin Mission. So these things are lining up with what the confidential source was uh, claiming happened. And on the um, chat servers, Ricky <laughs> admitted to buying, quote unquote, land, a house, a vehicle, and a quad vehicle. And I take that from the court papers. And I would say that's very, very conservative to <laughs> what we just looked at. Right. We know that it was not a quad vehicle. Um, we can't confirm that there are multiple trucks if one was traded in or there was separate and we have no indication from the pictures that there was uh land and a house purchased yeah it, I, I mean it could have been any of those houses that we saw it sitting with in the background yeah we, we'd have no idea but um chat conversation also identified victim phone numbers and sim a victim phone number and a sim card the community worked together to steal 57 Bitcoin. So at the time that this is going on, Bitcoin was about $8,000 per coin. So what they figured was the community was involved in about a half a million dollars. Uh, the, it, I, I would say shy of a half a million dollars. So it was $469,000. Later, a, a co-conspirator claimed that they actually stole uh, $513,000 and they agreed to split it $128,000 four ways. And then I did the math and I was like, well, somebody's getting an extra $1,000 in there. Maybe it's the person that did the well, math. Well, maybe they that... sold the Bitcoin at different times where the Bitcoin was worth more than others. The bigger question is where else but Florida could you buy a house, land, a vehicle, and multiple quads for 128 grand? That sounds like a great deal. <laughs> no kidding. All right, so another thing that they saw in the chat server, I say they, law enforcement, they saw in the chat server was um, evidence of money laundering. So this Bitcoin, this virtual coin that we talk about is not a physical thing that you hold on to. But you can do sort of the same types of things that you would do with money laundering with physical money. So... For instance, with physical money, you might take a dollar that you gain the dirty way and you might find a way to translate it over to a Canadian dollar, right? And that transaction is, you know, probably one of many transactions that would um, happen in a, money in a money laundering scheme. So you can do the same sort of thing under um, cryptocurrency where you can take let's say a Bitcoin and you can buy um, Monero. And what that does is it takes one type of coin and the money gets transferred from that and it goes over to a different type of coin. 
you know, maybe my, I don't know if my analogy with using Canadian dollars is exactly falls along those lines, but I was just trying to give you a, a good flavor of in the virtual world. That's how it works. Usually is you send it from one exchange on one type of coin to another exchange, another type of coin and so forth. And you do that a few times and it makes it very difficult to track back to where the, um, uh, original coins uh, originated. Are you with me, Seth? I'm with you. I'm taking a note. All right. So Ricky's investigated. Um, at this point, they have search warrants and subpoenas are issued um, for all sorts of things like the chat servers that we just talked about, um, Coinbase, and so forth. And I didn't say what Coinbase was, but I'll mention it now. Coinbase is one of those exchanges that you can go to to buy cryptocurrency. So if I wanted to hold a Bitcoin, I would go open an account on Coinbase. I would put money in it and I would then go buy however much Bitcoin that I could with that amount of money. And then my Coinbase would then be like my bank in a way and it would hold that Bitcoin for me. And then if I want to do other things like transfer it to somebody else or buy something, I would then go to my Coinbase account and basically transfer any coins that I have out of my account to somebody else. And that process right there, that that's public. So that whole transaction is public to the extent of account. It's kind of like account name. So you sort of see the account name that these transactions happen. You don't see that Keith Jones did it. You see that account A did it. You see account it was transferred over to account B. To complete that picture, to see who did it, you need to subpoena records from places like Coinbase. So you can say, hey, Coinbase, I see you're the holder of account A and account B. What information can you give me about them? And you're going to be very surprised at the information that they provide back. So with Ricky, when they came to them with those um with that court paperwork, they said, hey, we have Ricky's driver's license number, his date of birth, his address, his debit card number, his phone number, his crypto wallet identifier, and his IP addresses that he logged into us from. So it's a whole bunch of stuff. And on top of that, they have a picture of Ricky's Florida driver's license attached to his account because that's part of the Coinbase sign up and verification process is you use some kind of, you know, government documentation to prove you are who you are and it gets attached to your, your account. So, so have, here's a question for you, Keith, would a more sure savvy criminal have used like a dark web based version of Coinbase that is not as let's say strict uh, or maybe more strict than what they don't allow you to put in there to identify yourself and associate back um, with, I would say you know, your account. I would say in general, yes, but I think a lot of these places are cracking down on being able to stay anonymous for its users because, like Coinbase and so forth. I know, like for a while, you could just have an account, and they didn't really ask you. I mean, they asked you in text information about you, but you could lie and put you know fake information in there. This one now they ask for a picture. Um, for a driver's license. And I think, I don't know if it's like tax purposes or what the heck they need the documentation for, but there's, I think that you're seeing more and more of these exchanges having to have some kind of personal and identifiable information like that on file for people, especially if, if, if taxing comes around and it's like the criminals want their money. And that's like the choke point. That's like where you get them is if they put in real information like Ricky's real driver's license, that's where you get them. It, I think I, you know, and I've only looked at maybe a couple handful of these cases. So do you have any thoughts? Well, I'm, I'm putting myself in the mind of the criminal here. Clearly being on a chat to kind of brag about your, your, fraudulent cryptocurrency prowess is probably not a great idea, even if it's, you know, seemingly anonymous. Um, so in the chat server, Ricky claims to have had six figures worth of crypto. And we know from his IP address 
uh, that Ricky accessed Coinbase uh, about 99 times, uh, basically from the spring of uh, 2017 to the spring of 2018. So he was clearly busy buying all those quads and jet skis and stuff using Coinbase to, you know, uh, conduct those transactions. Um, and that that same IP address uh, discovered access to the community's uh, chat servers, right? Uh, approximately, what, 274 times between yeah. um, uh, April of 2018 and June of 2018. So a treasure Watch trove for law enforcement here, right? And not probably a ton of work to get access to it other than a search warrant. Yeah, and in total, they were talking about approximately 82 Bitcoin that were either sold or sent from Ricky's account. And they, Coinbase said that 81.72 of them came from outside sources. So it means money came into his account and it didn't come from him buying it using his credit card or bank account or something like that. You know, right. somebody transferred it to him and it was a great amount being 80 some odd um, Bitcoin. Yeah. Now, we just talked about an IP address, and if you don't know what that is, don't worry. Uh, computers just need to know how to talk to each other, and they use numbers, basically, to talk to each other. Um, so when you're talking out on the Internet and you're going to www.google.com, that's the human-readable name that you know, but there's this thing called an IP address behind the scenes that your web browser knows to go to to visit google.com. So... When we talked earlier about Ricky's IP addresses matching across these different services, what it's saying is he's coming from the same source on the internet, the same addressable source on the internet. And in some cases, you can link an IP address to a person. So if I'm a single bachelor and I lived at home and I only had a, my cable modem and it was through Comcast and Comcast gave me an IP address of a.a.a.a, and those A's being some number between zero, uh, basically one and two fifty four ish. If they if they uh, give that to me and I'm the only person that lives there, it's a pretty safe bet that I'm the person creating the traffic on the internet that's addressed to that IP address. Um, in other cases, you can't necessarily do that because if you're at a work address, your work address, and you have a thousand employees there and everybody's coming out of your work address looking like the same IP address because um, these things are finite. There's only so many of them on the internet, so you don't use more of them than you need. And if your corporation only needs one to basically represent everybody, well, then when you have an IP address, you don't know if it's one person in the company or the other person in the company or the third person in the company or so forth. So. Just having an IP address itself isn't the thing that's the big deal. It's being able to take the IP address and then tying it to somebody. And usually um, that's where a lot of the law enforcement work is, is taking the IP address and saying, you know, which uh, provider or which source did it come from. All right, so more information from the search warrant subpoena results. The on, From the chat server, Ricky and another conspirator discuss Hacking the CEO of Gemini, which is a crypto exchange. We talked about Coinbase just a little bit ago. Think of Gemini as just another type of Coinbase. It's just a competitor to Coinbase. Um, they targeted specifically his T-Mobile phone and his Skype account. And remember this T-Mobile because I'm going to talk about that um, closer to the end of this podcast. But what happens is Ricky's conspirator, he says he will call his quote-unquote guy at T-Mobile to find his CEO's account. And you got to think, Seth, like at an earlier point in this podcast, we were talking about how you can do a SIM swap and it's either you trick an, you trick an employee or you bribe an employee. This almost sounds like he's got somebody that he's bribing at T-Mobile, doesn't it? Well, it clearly sounds like he's got somebody. The question I was having was, thinking to myself is, well, several questions, but the two big ones are how much money does it take to bribe an employee, you know, at, at, at a retail store like that. Um, and what is that, the risk associated with that user? In other words, how much money, if I'm a T-Mobile employee making 20 bucks an hour, how much money do I need to go in and, you know, I guess, um, do the typey typey thing to change, um, an account to account for a SIM card. 
And what are the odds of getting caught and doing that? Um, I wonder if that calculus was kind of being run in the T-Mobile uh, employee's head. I don't think it is. I don't know if I have the specific numbers in my slides, but I will tell you that it's on the orders of like thousands of dollars, like low thousands, not like, not not over ten thousand. Let's put it that way. Yeah, like it's it's very low for what Ricky and the community. It's a good deal for it. Ricky, right? For Ricky and the conspirators. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know it's it's uh, it's you know. It's a small price to pay to have, you know, essentially uh, the key to the crime here. And this is the, the I think that the, the, the key clincher is, you know, and we're going to get to this at the, end, at the end of this podcast, but I want to make it clear here. You can't control the bribed employee at a store that, you know, houses your data, right? You know, the store that has, you know, your, your, um, your, your network access for your phone. If one of those employees is going to do something illegal, there's very little you can do about that. And that's unfortunately just a fact we have to accept. Yeah, one last note is we did see a T-Mobile shortcut on that source's computer, source number one we talked about at the very beginning. Yeah. We did see the word T-Mobile in there. So um, keep this all in mind that he has a guy at T-Mobile and we saw T-Mobile information because we're going to talk about that again. All right, so like most law enforcement investigations were now to the point where law enforcement interviews Ricky and uh, he consents to an interview and he admitted to laundering more than a hundred K cryptocurrency in the past year. And he also admitted to using his mobile phone to facilitate the crypto exchanges. So that's a uh, pretty anticlimactic, right? After figuring out all that stuff and on the chat server and putting the web together and all that stuff, Ricky just basically said, yep, yep. Did it. Did it. Made a lot of money. Did it. So based upon the fact that he interviewed and said, I did it, um, he then decided to plead. So on October 18th, 2019, there were, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven different counts against him originally. Six of them were... Um, dismissed and they vary anything from like fraud by wire to fraud with identification documents and so forth. But he did plea or he did have a guilty plea to a account one, which was conspiracy to commit fraud, which was, um, well, it's important. Interesting though, that they threw the book at him, right? They had seven different charges, um, against him that were dismissed and they were heavier due. There was actual fraud, fraud by wire, fraud with identification documents, Fraud by wire, radio, or television, several counts of that. Uh, and that was all dismissed, and he pled guilty to an attempted fraud, an attempted conspiracy. However, his, he did agree to jail time, all right, or a, couple of, a couple of years, um, excuse me, more than that, 48 months, so four years. Supervised release, I guess, at 36 months. Special assessment of $100, which is weird to me. But he had to pay back over $7.5 million in restitution which I'm not sure how that's possible if he only kind of pocketed, let's say it was more than a hundred grand. Let's say he was being conservative when he was bragging on his chat sites, but that could take him four lifetimes to pay back. Yeah. No kidding. I thought about that this whole time when I was um, doing the research on this case and other cases, when they have these huge restitutions and it's like these people come from, a lot of these people come from places where they don't have a lot of money and then they score big like this and they go out and buy a bunch of toys, and then they get caught, and then all those toys get taken away, and then it's like, you owe millions of dollars. It's like, how are you going to pay that million of dollars? Because now you're a convicted felon. Right. It's not like he was, you know, this Wall Street whiz where he's got so much money socked away that even if he did a couple of years and had to pay some of it back, he's got a whole other account in the Cayman Islands or in Switzerland to live nicely off of. That was his, you know, that was his bag, right? And all his toys are taken away now, and now he's got this almost impossible you know, restitution over his head. Not that I feel bad for him, but you have to wonder from a, a criminal justice perspective, I don't know, like, you know, getting, you're never going to get $7 million out of this guy. Nope. Nope. I would say not. Well, legally, <laughs> maybe he'll come up with another scheme. Who knows? I mean, putting on my lawyer hat, you'd have to wonder, you know, were the victims, you know, criminal, uh, sorry, civilly or criminally suing T-Mobile for you know, um, not taking due diligence in their hiring process and hiring people who are, you know, helping uh, commit fraud as a co-conspirator. Yeah. yeah, good point. Well, another point 
on his plea was um, buried in the um, legal wording. I found this really interesting passage that I didn't, I haven't seen on a lot of other pleas that I'm going to read to you. It says, when it says he, we're talking about Ricky now, it says he also agrees to undergo any polygraph examination the government may choose to administer concerning such assets and to provide and or consent to the release of his tax returns for the previous five years. So what I read in that is we don't trust Ricky to tell us what he actually owns. <laughs> Indeed not for sure. Um, and also, you know, to be fair, I mean, we don't even know other than making fun of his name and that he's a Florida man. Um, you know, the, the level of sophistication of Ricky here, right? You know, we can make fun of his quads and his jet skis and whatnot, but um, maybe he's significantly more wily and uh, and sophisticated than, than we're giving him credit for, or not. Yeah, like you mentioned earlier, Seth, um, his sentencing, so it came down to 48 months and supervised release is three years, but um, I might not mention it in cases going forward, but this is almost standard that you see in computer crime cases is they'll do some kind of computer or internet monitoring program for any type of person that is allowed back on a computer. Usually I see two things. One is right. you're never allowed back on a computer, or if you're allowed back on a computer, we're going to monitor you. And in Ricky's case, um, he'll be allowed back on his computer um, once he's supervised, but he's going to be supervised on a computer too. So they're going to put... Uh, I don't want to say spyware, but basically like the legit version of spyware to watch what it is he does on a computer to hopefully either alert um, if he does something bad again or, you know, at least have evidence if he does do something bad again. Right. Now, um, part of his um, sentencing is forfeiture. Um, you know, they said you're going to serve this amount of time in prison and you're going to pay us all this money. But there's also this forfeiture part. So basically any Bitcoin, any type of coin, virtual current, cryptocurrency that we've been talking about that he owns, the government just basically took. So there were like 38 Bitcoin seized, which was um, $282,000 in 2019. There was 900 Ethereum seized, and that was um, just over $400,000. There were another 38 Bitcoin seized from another account. That was about $300,000. There's 900 Ethereum seized, which was um, about $160,000. And all that was interesting, right? Like that's all the cryptocurrency money. And it was a lot of money. Where, you know, you add those up and it's probably close to a million dollars. But here's where I started getting interesting. They took a Ford F-250 Platinum uh, 2017 truck from him and the yeah that VIN was the number. second truck we saw that had the lift kit on it yep that uh vin number and everything is right there in the paperwork um we have a 2018 polaris ranger xp all-terrain vehicle and it has a vin number so i would assume it's probably one of the bigger ones um there's a 2019 polaris high lifter rz rx all-terrain vehicle and it's got a vin number on that uh so basically <laughs> He had to give up his coins and his toys. And it's interesting because we know that we saw at least three different um, three different uh, ATVs. So who knows how many he actually hid or maybe he stole. I also thought it was interesting to note that he looks like he's moved either on or in addition to his Bitcoin um, work into Ethereum, right, in, in 2019 before he finally got busted. So he was definitely, you know, enjoying the crypto uh, revolution. Yeah, definitely. Um. So the monetary penalty, um, I believe we already said this, but it was seven point six million. And oh my God, how could you pay that back if that was judged against you? So yeah, there's um, three victims that the um, the initials are in the court paperwork. There's three victims. One victim with the lowest amount was about one hundred four hundred sixteen thousand was his amount of loss. Second victim was about one point nine million was the amount of their loss, and then. The highest amount, the last victim was five point, almost five point yeah. six. The third million. victim really took it on the chin the hardest in terms exactly. of percentage. Yeah, almost so that's how they came up dollars. with that number according to the court paperwork. All right, so we've been talking about this. We said Ricky, and we've been making fun of his name and all this stuff, but we haven't really talked about too many other people other than 
maybe some uh, employees at cell phone places. So um, who are these other community members? Well, we can tell you that four additional people were charged. Two additional people had all their charges dismissed, so that's six. And then there are three accomplices named in a complaint, which is kind of like this limbo land of kind of like being charged, but you're in the court system, but you haven't really gotten past like indictment or anything like that yet where it got real serious. So, and then I believe if you looked up those three, I believe they were dismissed at one point way in the future. So one of the people from the community, his name was Colton. And I'm going to murder all these names. I'm going to do this in every single podcast. I don't pronounce things all that well, Seth. So if you want to laugh, I'm not going to feel bad. Go no, I think this dude's name isn't that hard. Where he's from is harder to pronounce than his last name. So Colton Jurassic? Is that how you'd say yeah, it? Yeah, it's like Jurassic, but with eyes. That's easily. The question is, where in Iowa is Dubuque? Wow, yeah. Dubuque. Is that Iowa. how you'd pronounce that? Well, how I would have pronounced it is I would have just said he came from Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. He went gay from Iowa. Yeah. Him and, him and, um, uh, him and Captain Kirk. So he was 18 back in 2017. I say that because that's when, you know, these crimes were going on. Um, but it also pre- makes him an adult. Yes. Yes. Very importantly. And um, guilty plea. His plea was conspiracy to commit wire fraud. Prison for him was 42 months. So slightly less than Ricky. Supervised release was two years, was slightly less than Ricky. Ricky was three. And again, uh, monitoring program once uh, he's back on the internet. Mon- monetary penalty. So this is where above and beyond Ricky, like he just, he was like, Ricky, hold my beer. Cause when they, they took the restitution for him, his victims it is 9.5 million. And that comes from six different uh, victims ranging from a thousand seven hundred dollars up to $5.5 million. So it looks like that one $5.5 million they used in Ricky's restitution. Yeah, the numbers well. are the same, right? The, you know, yeah, the 116000 is the same amount. The 5.5 is the same amount. But this guy has a couple of other um, victims, including a fairly big ticket fish, right, with a person at $3.1 million. Yeah. So he's got one person at $5.5 million and another person at three point one. That's heavy. So next is Ryan Gafar Abbas. Was that how you pronounce it, Seth? Did I murder that? I think that's fairly accurate. Rochester, New York, so up your way. Way up my way. That's about five hours away. And back in 2017, he was 17 to 18 years old. Um, Also pled guilty. Same plea as the rest, conspiracy to commit wire fraud. Prison for Abbas is... 24 months, so two years, and supervised release is three years with internet monitoring. So Abbas's, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, his monetary penalty was uh, $310,000, so a lot less than the other two. They only linked him to, it looks like, three victims ranging anywhere from 54000 to 140000 I, I wonder if that's almost worse because that's like an achievable amount, right? Yeah, you could almost... Uh, depending on what he does, but I being a, I think to be a convicted felon in any industry has got to be tough. It's got to be tough, and to come up with three hundred thousand dollars in any industry as a felon is just it's got to be tough. You know, you'd also wonder. I would wonder. Um, you know, I'm not sure if you guys have all seen uh, the movie Catch Me If You Can um about frank abagnale which if you haven't seen it, it's a terrific movie but it's an awesome movie i love it frank abagnale is a real guy and the story is mostly true right you had a guy who was a criminal in the 60s uh and 70s who used technology and uh i guess social engineering before it was a thing to get away with massive financial crimes um but after he did his time he worked for the government and he was extremely effective uh in doing that i think he went private and helped develop some pretty cool security protocols i wonder if any of these guys would have the opportunity to do that, um, especially given the you know the the relatively um, immature world of crypto. They were able to jump on that bandwagon pretty early and figure out a way to, you know, um, you know, hack into vulnerabilities around that world, uh, and and you know, briefly make a lot of money on it. 
Yeah, you do see that. Like, um, I've had to take security courses by Kevin Mitnick. You know, he was famous back in the day. Um, so you do see that, I think, in our industry a little bit. But I think there's probably... I've done a lot of research for these cases, Seth, and there's a lot of exciting stuff coming along. And I'll tell you, like, this is not an abnormal case. There's so many people that do this kind of thing. Right. That, you know, even if one, you know, how many percent of them can really go that route where they can be like, "Ah, I'm a good guy now. I'm going to go do this good guy job. You know, there's, there's only so many of them that can come out of this where there's, um, you know, a bunch of people doing the crime. There's only, you're only going to have so many that will turn. Um, you'll be able to do, you'll be able to put in the white hat role. Yeah. I mean, I just find it interesting that, you know, these guys were way ahead of the curve, um, you know, in, in getting in on the crypto game and figuring out a way to, to break into it um, in a fairly aggressive way, you know, with, with the, as we said, you know, nothing you can do about, you know, bribing the T-Mobile employee. Um, I just, you know, you wonder if they could contribute back to society in a positive way rather than, you know, get meaningless, you know, what blue collar jobs and minimum wage and, and a restitution that I'd be able to repay. I'm not feeling bad for them. I'm just wondering if we can do something with them. Well, you know what? I think you, you must be leading me in to the next individual because the next individual is Garrett Endicott, which I think I can pronounce that one. Okay. Warrensburg, Missouri. 19 years old back in 2017, also pled guilty, conspiracy to commit wire fraud, imprisoned, and I use air quotes, only for 10 months because we saw 40 some odd months earlier, but 10 months for Garrett. Supervised release, three years with internet monitoring. Now, this is where it goes back to what you were just talking about, Seth. So I'm going to read this exactly from the court document, quote unquote. Once per month for the first three months of supervision, the defendant shall complete a community speaking engagement regarding cybercrime or cybersecurity. The court recommends this involve children or at risk individuals and the dangers of cybercrime. And it's like, <laughs> I, I looked at this a bunch of different ways. I looked at it like how you just looked at it with, with hey, it's great that this guy's going to turn around, you know, and give positive back to the, back to the community. I also looked at this like maybe the other attorney was like, man, this is really going to get him. Like when he gets out, he has to then go back and talk to people about what he did. Cause you know, I, not a lot of people can, you know, just stand up in front of him and be like, this is what I did. This is my crime. What do you think, Seth? I, you know, I, I, I'm trying to look at it pragmatically. So you got a 19 year old kid who is, you know, being forced to talk about his crime, uh, you know, specifically to at risk children. Uh, and the dangers of cybercrime. Maybe it's a great thing. I'm not quite that cynical. I think a kid would uh, maybe get more out of hearing uh, a fellow, you know, fairly young person talking about, you know, the thing he did or she did that was bad and why it was bad and, you know, things like that versus somebody who was less relatable. I don't know. I, I didn't find this particular part of it funny, um, but I do think it's, it's fairly interesting uh, and maybe a good thing. Yeah, nobody else had it. No, none of the other uh, defendants. Right. Had. And yeah, and Garrett and, wasn't the youngest, right? There was another person who was 17 and 18 yeah, years like 17, old. 17, 18 years old. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and I'm not a member at the top of my head if Garrett was more invested in the crime versus some of the other co conspirators in the community. Uh, they were not all treated equally, though, for sure. No, and, and there were definite leaders. Um, the reason why I picked Ricky to talk about the longest was Ricky was obviously, well, a, the confidential source gave him up first, but B, it looked like Ricky was more like the ringleader of the group, if you want to say that. Uh, Endicott's monetary penalty was, oh, low compared to the other ones, $121,000. Right, right. And again, it's that same, and here's another question. So the first victim there has that same $116,000 amount. Um, I think the restitution you know, it's joint and several. You guys, I'm not sure if that's a legal term that people are familiar with. It means that everybody is responsible for it, not like um, individually, or and not like you have to add it all up to get to a certain number. You all have to pay the same amount. So, you know, GP might receive it, I guess, whoever, it's whoever pays it first. I'm not exactly sure of the logistics of it, but, 
you know, the number is if, if you add up all the restitution and have to be paid back by all the uh, individuals, it adds up to a whole lot more than the actual amount of loss. Yep. And that's why I brought a lawyer onto this show. <laughs> all right. So our next one, we have the two people that had charges of Smith. So there was a counter Freeman. That was 18 and 2017 Dublin, Ireland. So that's the um, the only and person that wasn't in the United and States. And that's the ghetto spelling we have on our on our. Uh, <laughs> Dude, I gotta change it because I have OCD. But I spelled Ireland I R E L I N. That's close enough. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm more than happy to laugh at myself. That's that's awesome. All right. Next person, Ryan Stevenson, was also had charges dismissed, uh, 24, back in 2017, and from West Haven, Connecticut. And now we get to the phone company employees. These are the accomplices that I wasn't sure if I should count. We have three of them. They were just named in a criminal complaint. The first one is Jared White. He was 20 in 2017. He's from Tucson, Arizona. He was a contract employee of AT and T, and that make that might make sense of why this employee may have been a little more easy. It was easier for this employee to go sideways. Seth is I've I've seen in the past in cases that I've investigated, contract employees have tend a little less loyalty. I'm not saying not all of them, but some contract employees have a little less loyalty than the people that work at the company, and I've seen them do bad things. So Jared White, um, he facilitated theft of over $2.1 million, so <laughs> a lot of money. Um, also communicated via Telegram with all these other community members that we've been talking about. And Jared White alone was responsible for 29 SIM swaps. I don't know what he got paid exactly. I know it was like in the thousands of dollars, but for 29 cent swaps, I'd want to be paid more than thousands of dollars because you know you know, there's records somewhere. I want to better understand why their cases were dismissed. I mean, they were not only the accomplices. I would argue they were the, they were the, um, the, call, the fulcrum of making this crime be possible. I don't understand how their complaints were dismissed. It, the court documentation that I read basically came across like, Ricky and the community were the drivers of everything. And these people were just picked up and bribed. Like they weren't the brains behind everything. So For sure. And I, I that's, and maybe they didn't have a reasonable anticipation that their actions could result in the theft of $2.1 million and so forth. But they still clearly violated several rules of the, of the company and laws. Uh, I'm not saying that they should have been doing the same amount of time as the drivers, but I would argue that they definitely, um, something I, I'm curious as to why their complaints were dismissed, unless the, the DA was just happy to get a conviction on the people they got and walked away. I don't know. Yeah, who knows? I'm not a criminal lawyer. Well, Robert Jack, he was also 20 uh, from Tucson, Arizona, also worked at AT&T with Jared White. Um, with White, if you combine them together, they performed 41 swaps. So it was it was a lot of damage that they did. Yeah. I mean, it was, that's what I'm saying. They went through, a, there was a lot of damage in their wake. And the fact that their complaints were dismissed is just a bit of an unknown for me. All right. So our third person is Fenley Joseph. He's 26 back in 2017, and he's from Marietta, California. He was from Verizon, and he provided personally identifiable information and used Telegram. So we talked about bribing a per, bribing a telephone employee to sw do a SIM swap for you, and we kind of ran with that the whole podcast. But we there's this other way you could also do a SIM swap, and that is trick the per trick the phone employee. So when you call in and you say, "I have a new SIM." and I want to attach it to this phone number, or I want to attach it, you know, I want to attach this phone number to this SIM. When you say that, they're going to ask you questions about yourself. They're going to say, what's your date of birth? Where, what's your billing address? What's your social security number? What's your email address? To prove that you are who you are when you want to do this very deep account-altering uh, activity on your account. 
So now Finley Joseph, instead of just doing the sim swaps like Robert Jack and Jared White did, what he did was provide that information. So right. if I was the attacker, Keith Jones was the attacker, I would call in and I'd say, you know, I'm I'm Seth Eichenholz. You know, I'm trying to be Seth. I'm Seth Eichenholz. And they say, oh, when were you born? And I know Seth's birth year because I bought it from Fenley Joseph. They say, oh, what's your email address? I know that too because I bought it from Fenley Joseph. They say, oh, what's your billing? You know, what's your social security number? Oh, I know that. Also bought it off of Fenley Joseph. I have all the stuff that they're going to ask for. And they say, well, this must be Seth. And then they do the SIM swap for me and then it happens. So it's a little bit different than just going in and bribing. You're bribing for information rather than bribing someone to do the SIM swap for you if that makes sense. Well, and moreover, I think what went, went unsaid here is between uh, our, our three different phone company employees, they had to kind of, I'm assuming, inform our, our, the community um, cohorts you know, what steps and what criteria they would even need to pull this off, right? They had yeah. to know specifically what specific PII items they would need um, you know, in order to effectuate a, swim, a SIM swap. Yep. And I'll mention it again. Well, we won't be mentioning it every time, but PII is personally identifiable information. And uh, you'll see it written both ways in our, our industry. So those three, they had their complaints dismissed. Now, here's the big surprise. Remember how I kept saying T-Mobile, remember, remember earlier? Well, none of those three people charging complaints, none of them are from T-Mobile. And one of the uh, individuals in the community kept saying, I have a guy at T-Mobile. You saw that folder on someone's desktop, the, the confidential source number one that says T-Mobile. So somebody's at T-Mobile that wasn't even mentioned in the complaint. So immediately my question to myself in my head was, well, how many people are out there that got away with it if we're only seeing three? All right. Well, we have come to the end of this story for our very first episode, Seth. What do you think? Um. I thought it was great. I thought it was an interesting, fun case. I and mean, we talked a lot about this case, but in reality, it was a fairly simple case. Um, and I, I think that the, the De Niro in Goodfellas uh, is, is the key thing, which we'll get to in a second. Um, but uh, I do think it's kind of worth running through a lessons learned um, or key takeaways you want our, our audience to remember about this case. So there's like five key things we want everyone to remember. So Keith, uh, let's go through them. Sure, absolutely. And I did pick this case because. You're going to see these first few episodes, Seth, as you as we talk about more technologies, they kind of build on each other. So we're going to talk in I think maybe episode two or three. We're going to say, hey, this thing happened and they used a SIM swapping attack. And we're not going to talk hours on end about SIM swapping because we have a whole episode on it now. So do, do expect that coming up in the future that we'll be able to talk about more interesting details because we can just basically say, hey. The SIM swapping attack occurred, and if you want to know inf more information about that, go back to episode one. Yep, for sure. But for this episode, um, all right, so I tried to list five different things that I took away from this case. And one is the number one thing. I don't want anybody to walk away from this podcast thinking that you should turn off your two-factor authentication because it's not useful. Yes, we talked about an attack where somebody on the inside can uh, take over some somebody's SIM card and take over their phone and that can get around two-factor authentication, but that does not mean don't enable it. Always, always, always enable it if you're given the chance. Even if it's just um, using the text message, the lowest form, it's still better than not having anything. Yeah, and you'd be surprised how many individual people, smaller corporations just don't employ it. You know, Maybe they haven't done the math to figure out how much having you know, uh, a secure ID uh, or tokenization, uh, it, it, but it's it's such a um, it's such a, a standard, or at least it needs to be a standard that a lot of people don't enforce. So it's not a panacea, but it's certainly a minimum that you should have. And it's come a long way. I mean, when I started in computers and they had these tokens, they were physical. I don't even know how to describe it. It's about the size of a matchbox. It was a physical token. That's all it did was basically go through those numbers for you. But now we got it on phones. You know, Duo Duo doesn't even give you a token. You you um, uh, go authenticate to a service that uses Duo, and a push comes to your phone and goes, hey, are you logging into such and such? And you type yes or no, and it's that simple. So always, always uh, employ two-factor if you can. 
Yes, for sure. For our second one, do uh, you want to take this, Seth? Sure. So the key thing on this is anyone can be a victim of this specific crime. Most of you have cell phones. I know I do. Um, if you have four, that's suspect. <laughs> but, um, and as we said, you know, there's just certain things that can happen that you don't have control over. You don't know that the person who is, you know, uh, setting up your new phone at your at your provider, you know, doesn't have a, a side a side gig where he's getting a thousand bucks a week to swap some sims out or things along those lines. There's just nothing we can do about that. Um, so the key point is you want to put yourself in the best position possible to not be one of the victims here. Um, you know, sometimes it's unavoidable, but putting yourself in the best position certainly lowers the odds. Yeah. And try not to be the most lowest hanging fruit out there. Right. So if you can employ even just a little more security than the basic security, you know, do it. It reminds me of that joke. If you're in a crowd of people and you're being chased by a bear, you don't have to be the first, you just can't be last. <laughs> Exactly. All right. So our third point is I thought it was pretty darn easy to steal millions of dollars. Like it didn't take that much. You go and you, if you have the dollars and you bribe somebody to do a SIM swap for you, there's a little bit behind the scenes of taking a control of their accounts. But once you have a control of their accounts, you just siphon off their money and that's it. So uh, to me, I thought it was very, the, it wasn't like the move. I don't like computers in movies, but I, I, I will say it's not like computers in movies where it's like you have to do 50 attacks on that one little thing to get that money. It, like this is a very, very simple attack that Ricky and the community pulled off and they got a very, very big payoff for it. And they got to do it pretty much in their pajamas, right? I mean, they didn't have to leave their house if they didn't want to. You know, I, I'm looking at this a little bit differently um, in terms of it doesn't take much to steal millions online. What I've seen in my experience uh, through my own professional career is the really slick criminals don't take millions at one shot, right? Because that's certainly, that gets to our fifth point here uh, in terms of being flashy. The really slick ones slice it off, you know, small pieces here and there. It becomes less noticeable. Um, you know, not telling them how to commit crime here, but uh, I think that was a key element. The here, office right? space, the office, the space office theory. space, which really, yeah. to be fair, is 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 crib from, you know, Richard Pryor and Superman three, right? Where you know they're taking you know uh, additional percentages of 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 you know transactioned uh, pennies and just you know routing it all to one account. <laughs> and even then, I would have done it. I would have done it. You know, routing it all to one account over the course of time. Um, but my point is. I think you're going to gather it. And there were kind of two big issues here with this, right? One was it was a lot of money in a relatively short amount of time. But it was also, and I've heard this is true of hackers, um, hackers like to brag about their exploits. You know, they, they, they want to own it. It's almost like puffing their chest out and taking, taking credit for it rather than being quiet about it. And I think that's exactly what happened here. It was a large amount of money. And then going on to, a, I guess, a fairly common, you know, chat site for crypto, uh, related, you know, issues and, and kind of bragging to unknown people. Yeah, I stole hundreds of thousands of dollars of crypto. What did you do today? Uh, I thought was um, an interesting play that I would not have employed if I were the criminal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so we have a uh, point number four. You want to take that one and I'll take the fifth? Sure. So the point we wrote is once there is an informant in the group, the other players were charged, right? So it only takes, you know, that's why police are smart. They've done this a long time. They know they can pick a either the key person or a very turnable person that will usually lead to some indictments down the road, right? You know, uh, whether they're promising that person immunity or whether they're promising that person will have a lesser problem. Uh, so uh, it only takes to, you know, ability to kind of infiltrate one person. Yep. And then, uh, our fifth point on this one was I still went back and thought, why do you have your trucks and your quads on your Facebook page? And it goes back to that De Niro Goodfellas. And just why are you showing off your loot, Ricky? Well, you know, you have to ask your question. Like if you suddenly won the lottery, or you suddenly inherited a hundred million dollars. Would you tell anybody? I'm pretty sure I wouldn't. I'm pretty sure I would keep it so low key. Um, 
you know, and the immediate impetus would be like, ah, you know, I'd sell my house and get a much bigger house. And, you know, but I mean, I, I wouldn't dress differently. I do have a fetish for cars, so that might be a thing, but I'd certainly try to keep it <laughs> low profile. Um, and I think that's an important, right? And especially if you're dealing maybe with criminals who previously came from or, you know, financially had very little, you know, they'd be very eager to not only get their toys, but show them to their friends on Facebook. And a lot of people, you know, for as sophisticated as these, guy were, as these criminals were to pull off this crime, they weren't so slick as to not be careful on their Facebook settings and who could see you know, their pictures. So I found that also very interesting. Yeah. And, and just to, to be, can, to have a guilty plea and still have those pictures up and the kicker of it being public just blew my mind. So I thought that was important enough to pull out to a point. Yeah, for sure. Well, great case. Um, Keith, I had fun with this one. Um, I'll let you go out in terms of uh, how to, you know, how to start a conversation with our very new podcast. Sure thing. So right now we're probably only talking to both of our wives, <laughs> our wives that are listening to this, but maybe in the future, if somebody listens back in our first, our first episode and want to know how to reach us, here's some ways. First, we have a website. It's just e crime bites, bites spelled the computer way B Y T E S. So it's just. E C R I M E B Y T E S dot com. You can hit us on email. It's ecrimebytes at gmail dot com. Ooh, and I should back up on that website up in the upper top. Uh, you can actually get to all these other um, ways or other social media accounts and so forth. So if you want to go to one spot to get all these things that I'm talking about, go to the website. Uh, if you're on Facebook, we have a Facebook page. Just search for E-Crime Bites. Um, it just should show up in there. There was nothing that even looked remotely like it, so it should show up right away. And then Twitter. We have a Twitter account. It's E-Crime Bites. And I should mention that we also do have a Macedon account. Um, I do. It's a little bit longer than E-Crime Bites, but E-Crime Bites is in the name, and it's at... Um, uh, I forget which server off the, off the top of my head, but if you go off to uh, ecrimebytes.com and you click at the top, there's a Macedon link and it'll take it right there too. So if you don't, if you're not going to be a Twitter user, you have an alternative to reach us on Macedon too. So we try to be reachable to everybody. And with that, uh, we thank you for listening to our first episode and hopefully you will join us for our second, which will be just as crazy as the first. Thanks. Bye. Thank, thanks all. Bytes spelled the computer way, B-Y-T-E-S. So it's just E-C-R-I-M-E-B-Y-T-E-S dot com. You can hit us on email. It's ecrimebytes at gmail dot com. Oh, and I should back up. On that website up in the upper top, uh, you can actually get to all these other um, ways or other social media accounts and so forth. So if you want to go to one spot to get all these things that I'm talking about, go to the website. Uh, if you're on Facebook, we have a Facebook page. Just search for Eat Crime Bites. Um, it just should show up in there. There was nothing that even looked remotely like it, so it should show up right away. And then Twitter. We have a Twitter account. It's Eat Crime Bites. And I should mention that we also do have a Macedon account. Um, I do, it's a little bit longer than Eat Crime Bites, but Eat Crime Bites is in the name and it's at, um, uh, I forget which server off the, off the top of my head, but if you go off to, uh, ecrimebytes.com and you click at the top, there's a Macedon link and it'll take it right there too. So if you don't, if you're not going to be a Twitter user, you have an alternative to reach us on Macedon too. So we try to be reachable to everybody. And with that, uh, we thank you for listening to our first episode and hopefully you will join us for our second, which will be just as crazy as the first. Thanks. Bye. Thank, thanks all.